Over the years, the performance of CPUs has eclipsed that of RAM, and in fact, that gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. To deal with the disparity in speed, hardware manufacturers introduced caches. If you access a portion of RAM and it happens to reside in the cache, then great, execution will only take a few cycles. If not, you'll have to access RAM, and this will probably be around 100 times slower. So, if you care about good performance, you better make sure that you're taking advantage of the cache. This means that the way you lay out your data in memory may play a big part in performance. For example, let's say we have a definition of four-dimensional vectors called VEC4, and let's say we write a loop to calculate the sum of an array of these 4D vectors, but only with respect to the y-coordinate. This, for the record, is called an array of structs layout. Now, let's rewrite this code so that we no longer have a VEC4 class, but have four arrays instead, one for each coordinate. This is what we call a struct of arrays layout. So, how do these two layouts fur against each other? Well, on my laptop, whipping up a quick benchmark shows that the array of structs version processes approximately a billion vectors per second, whereas the struct of arrays version sustains a rate of at least 3.5 billion vectors a second, a 3.5 times speed up just by rearranging our data in memory, which is quite impressive. The difference in performance has to do with the difference in memory access patterns. In the case of array of structs, whenever we fetch the Y coordinate of a VEC4 element, we cause a cache miss. On the other hand, in the case of struct of arrays, because the Y coordinates are grouped together, we cause a cache miss once every four Y coordinate fetches. This quick benchmark shows the importance of picking the appropriate layout, as well as the fact that we want to be able to try out different layouts before sticking to a specific one. Unfortunately, this is not the case right now. You either stick to the OOP school and trade cache usage and performance for familiarity, readability and encapsulation, or you stick to the performance school and put up with less readable code and manual refactorings. Oh, and in any case, you still can't experiment with the different layouts easily. Good luck! So, a question arises. What if we could have OOP, flexibility and performance all at once? Surely this isn't just a pipe dream, right? Well, this is where Shapes comes into the picture. Shapes promises us the following. Firstly, we can control how our objects are laid out in memory in an easy manner. And secondly, we can store related objects together in memory. All that while keeping our business logic high level and oblivious to whatever layout we might be using. Shapes introduces two major concepts, the concept of pools and the concept of layouts. Pools group objects of the same type together. Each pool has a layout which specifies how objects are laid out in memory. Let's have a quick look at an example. In this example, the layout statement defines a layout called Vect4SOA. This definition states that each of the four fields of a Vect4 will be placed in different so-called clusters. This is effectively a definition of a struct of arrays layout for VEC4. The pool statement defines a new pool, P1, which will store VEC4 objects. These objects will be laid out according to the VEC4 SOA layout, that is, in a struct of arrays manner. We then construct two new VEC4 objects, P1 and V2. The angle brackets specify the pool as P1, hence they'll be constructed inside P1. The top right diagram shows how pool P1 and objects V1 and V2 will be represented in memory. Now, let's have a look at another example. Similar to the first example, this example declares the layout VEC4 mixed, which is a mixed layout. The X and Y coordinates are placed in one cluster whereas the Z and W coordinates are placed in another. Similarly, we construct pool P2, which will adhere to layout VEC4 mixed, and then construct two new objects inside it, V3 and V4. 
The bottom right diagram shows how pool P2 and objects V3 and V4 will be represented in memory. We said that shapes allows our business logic to be completely oblivious to the layout being used. So let's go and do exactly that. We'll define a method inside VEC4 that calculates the vector's magnitude. Now let's go and create two pools with different layouts and objects inside these pools. As you can see, calling magnitude on both objects is no different than the conventional method, method call in a typical object-oriented language. Layout oblivious method calls, however, are not enough to keep the business logic layout oblivious as well. Objects in pools must behave in the exact same manner as standalone objects in a conventional object-oriented language. References to pooled objects should behave in the exact same manner as regular references. In addition, we want references to be as compact as possible and ideally have the same size as that of a conventional pointer. The problem is that a reference to a pooled object will most likely need some information where, on where the pool is located and where the object is located inside the pool. Can we do better than that? Thus, we came up with an idea. What if we could statically know which pool an object belongs to? The first part of achieving this was to introduce the concept of pool parameters in the class definition. The first pool parameter is special. It specifies the pool an object belongs to. The pool parameters can be used in the types inside the class definition to specify the pool an object pointed to by the field belongs to. Let's take this example with the definition of class Edge. Edge specifies two pool parameters, E, which corresponds to the pool the current instance of Edge belongs to, hence it is implicitly a pool of edges, and V, which corresponds to a pool of vertex objects. In fields SRC and DSD, the type definition has V as the first pool parameter. This means that objects pointed to by SRC and DSD must belong to the same pool, that is V. Pool parameters are one part of the equation of statically knowing the pool an object belongs to. The second and most important part is that of a concept we call homogeneity. The basic idea behind homogeneity is that if you have two objects, O1 and O2, that are placed inside the same pool, then objects O1.f and O2.f must be also placed inside the same pool. So how do shapes enforce homogeneity? Well, unfortunately, we'll have to hand wave this answer and only say, in a nutshell, type system. But the general gist is that the bounds of pool parameters that specify the type of objects uh, a pool parameter holds are also enriched with pool parameters. Our type system will take these pool parameters in bounds and will be able to detect if homogeneity is somehow violated. For example, in the revised code for class Edge and Vertex, we have introduced a new pool bound for pool V in class Edge and a new pool bound for pool E in class Vertex. These pool bounds effectively assert that any vertex living in pool V must only reference the edges that live in pool V, E, and vice versa. That is, when you go ahead and construct pools PE and PV, edges residing in PE must reference the vertices in PV. Similarly, for pools PE2 and PV2, edges residing in PE2 must reference the vertices in PV2. The very last statement in our example violates this requirement because E1 can only reference vertices from PV and V1 belongs to pool V2, PV2. In general, our type system bears quite a lot of resemblance to ownership types and Java generics. Our initial approaches to addressing homogeneity were rather complex, and there was always yet another corner case that forced us back to the drawing board. It is actually rather surprising that we ended up with a simpler approach. Additionally, in our paper, we have proven that shapes guarantee progress, soundness, and it is possible to translate it into a low-level language in a meaning-preserving manner, and without having to keep track of runtime-type information at all. 
We'd be more to welcome to take any questions you might have during the QA or the extended discussion. Now, before we go ahead and implement a fully fledged Shapes compiler willy nilly, we also want to show that Shapes has merit in practice as well. For this reason, we decided to implement five case studies. We implemented these case studies in C and manually implemented the layouts that would be generated by Shapes. We'll focus on two of these case studies, Skeletal Animation and OP2. In 3D Skeletal Animation, you have a tree of joints and a list of weights. Each weight is controlled by one joint. Changing the joint orientations changes the weight's positions, thus changing the pose the 3D model takes, as you can see in the bottom picture. We want to see if an array of structs, a struct of arrays, or a mixed layout for the weights shows better performance. And that's exactly what we did. We implemented these layouts and then measured the total performance of each layout on three distinct 3D models, each duplicated n times. The chart shows a part of these results. Specifically, it shows a box plot of execution times of 20 different runs for each layout on my laptop with the number n of duplications being equal to 5,000. As you can see, it is the mixed layout that actually outperforms the other significantly, providing an approximate 1.15 times speed up. The struct of arrays layout does outperform array of structs convincingly, but not by much. As we can see, there is merit in using mixed layouts, and the flexibility of trying out different layouts would be quite beneficial. The second case study compares our manual shapes implementation against OP2, an open source library for performing computations on so-called unstructured grids. Unlike shapes, in OP2, the developer must lay out the data manually and tell OP2 how to access it. Additionally, OP2 offers limited flexibility with respect to layouts compared to shapes. The OP2 repository provides two example applications called Arrow and Airfoil. We implemented these applications and used the layouts they already use in the original OP2 code, as well as an AOS and, for Airfoil, SOA layout. We'll only present results of execution on my laptop for Arrow. The chart shows a box plot of 20 executions of Arrow for the original OP2 implementation, its equivalent shapes implementation with a mixed layout, and an AOS layout. As we can see, the mixed layout outperforms the AOS layout, and our implementation is only a bit slower compared to the original OP2 version. Hence, we should expect shapes to have comparable performance. In conclusion, we have shown that with shapes, it should be possible to have both OOP and cache-friendly layouts simultaneously. This means that it should be possible to have high-level code that is performant and efficient. And finally, it means that the end user will be happy as well. So thank you. That concludes this presentation. And we're now ready to take your questions.